I'm David Brown and I'm going to be talking to you today for a little while about uh, a short history of computer hardware, specifically switching hardware. Um, this presentation is part of a class I'm teaching at Pellissippi State Community College and the slides that you see over here to the right are part of, part of a comic book uh, textbook that I created and that we're using for that class. So anyway, over here um, is basically an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I wanted to kind of take you from an early history of computer hardware and kind of take you through the steps leading up to uh, microprocessors and where we basically are today with computer technology. So uh, picking up in the in the comic book textbook with Charles Babbage, Charles Babbage is um, considered by many to be the, the father of computers and one of the reasons is uh, his idea that you could separate a machine from its function. I guess he was the person who really articulated that idea uh, back in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s of, of dreaming of a machine whose function was not determined in advance. And of course, uh, that dream is realized in the modern day computer. The modern day computer really is a, a universal machine that can be made to do any task that you can lay out in a series of steps. The function of a computer is not laid out in advance the functions that you make the computer do are controlled by what we now call software. Uh, Babbage came up with a lot of these ideas and actually created some machines that were programmable using punched cards. Now he wasn't the first person to come up with punched cards to program a device, but it, he and a woman uh, named Ada Lovelace, who is uh, also considered by many to be the first programmer, um, they worked together and um, actually had a machine that was controlled by software. Now, uh, Bat in Babbage's time, he was working with uh, steam-based uh, machines, and he, he said he, he envisioned a time when uh, machines could calculate by steam. And that, that seems, uh, you know, archaic uh, to our ears, uh, but we're all used to electricity. But in his time, steam power was the main power. But uh, more importantly for air discussions, he was using base 10 and uh, trying to use gears to do calculations so that the gears had 10 positions to represent the numbers. Now, the next person that, that I come to in this story is Conrad Zusa, who was a person who was an engineer in Germany in the 1930s, and he envisioned this same kind of machine. He picked up on Babbage's ideas again, and, uh, but his big innovation was instead of using base uh, 10, like Zusa had tried to do, or like Babbage had tried to do, Zusa tried uh, to build machines using binary. He basically thought that instead of trying to build something that had these 10 different positions, that there already was something uh, in the electronics world that would allow you to use binary, and that thing was a switch, a, a switch or a relay. A relay was basically a switch that had, you know, switches have two positions, like a light switch has on and off. A switch has an on and an off. What I drew here was an open switch where current would not pass through a line if the switch was in, in line with it. And here's a, a switch that's closed, and so the current does pass through. So very simply, you could say, if no current is passing through here, we're gonna say that's a zero, and if current is passing through, we're gonna call that a one. And if those are the only two numbers that you have to represent, you can represent those with this really simple device, the switch. And that was Zeus's idea. So up here in the upper left was a machine, a part of a machine that was Babbage uh, was building. He never completed his machines. He lost his funding because people basically didn't really understand what he was trying to do. Sort of the same thing happened uh, with Conrad Zeus. He lost his funding uh, from Hitler because they, they felt like that his machines were going to take too long to build. I guess he did build some out of these relays and we see him here with a, a section of a machine that he built and basically the relays were switches that had a mechanical plate that switched back and forth. So storing just one bit would take up, you know, I don't know, uh, that amount of space. <laughs> um, so at this time, there was a device that had come along and was being used in radio, and it was a vacuum tube, and he applied for funding to build some uh, machines that would have been thousands of times faster than these, these mechanical uh, switching machines that he had built, uh, but he, lost, he didn't get the funding to do those. So, so 
the the really the effort to build a modern computer moved across the Atlantic here to uh, the Moore School of Engineering, and the Moore School of Engineering. Uh, they had been tasked by the Department of Defense to build a machine uh, to help them calculate firing tables for some of these big guns that they were building. Uh, the problem really wasn't the guns, it was the, the calculations of how to aim those. And so they proposed to build a machine out of this, this device that we see here, uh, which are called vacuum tubes. And vacuum tubes, they basically are like a switch you can you can connect leads here to these they have three wires coming in and if you apply current on this wire either yes or no you know whether you apply current or not you can make current pass through the vacuum tube so basically you can turn it on like a light bulb on and off so that you can make it switch on and off the advantage over relays are this is electronic uses electricity and it has no moving parts so all that's really moving there is electrons so thousands of times faster than a relay. The disadvantage, however, was it is like a light bulb. It puts off heat, lots of heat. Here, here's, here's one right here. It looks like a little light bulb. It puts off a large amount of heat, some light. Um, they burn out like light bulbs. And another thing, um, you know, when you have thousands of these, like this system that we see here, this is the ENIAC over here. Um, it attracts bugs, moths, and, and this, this word debug actually comes from um, this time when um, you would have to go through because if the moth got close to it, it can cause it to burn out, you know, or if the moth dies in there, it could make the tube burn out. So debugging the system meant going through and cleaning out the bugs. It's come to mean, um, you know, taking out imperfections out of software or hardware, but that's, that's really where that comes from, kind of weird. But anyway, vacuum tubes were a big advantage, but they had this disadvantage of heat and light. Um, this page is really about a story about Alan Turing, who's really another person that uh, has basically defined the computer science field, as I discussed earlier in this, this textbook. Um, he defined what a computation is in, in a paper he wrote, and he also set kind of the end bar for the field in his Turing test of machine intelligence, which we'll come to when we talk about artificial intelligence. We'll talk about Alan Turing almost every week in the class in, in something he's contributed to the field of computer science. This page kind of tells a, a sad story about his suicide and ill treatment after World War II, but I, uh, I'll leave that to uh, reading out the lecture notes. Um, after vacuum tubes, the next big innovation in hardware that was supposed to eliminate this heat problem uh, was transistors. There's a picture of one over here. Transistors are really small and I'm actually, that's not, that's almost a scale. That's, here's a transistor right here. They're really small, a lot smaller than vacuum tubes. And they're made out of silicon. They don't have the heat problems that the uh, vacuum tubes have. Um, again, you can attach leads to this and it, it operates like the vacuum tube does. You can apply current to this, this wire here or not. And I guess the term silicon, you know, you, and you may have heard it referred to as a semiconductor. What that actually means is uh, it may conduct or it may not. You know, there are things called insulators, which are like rubber that go around things that don't conduct electricity. And then the wires, which are conductive. Silicon, the odd thing about it is you can make it conduct or not by applying a, cur a current to part of it. So it can conduct or not. That's why it's called a semiconductor. And again, what we've got it to do is, it, it, it's a switch again that can represent zeros and ones. Uh, when we get to binary and we see how everything can be represented in these zeros and ones, you can see how that's actually stored on the hardware. Um, so anyway, the, the next innovation was this thing of uh, transistors. Uh, transistors solved the problems of the previous generation of hardware, which were basically the heat problems. It introduced kind of a, a because it was so easy to use and so small, uh, you can see a little picture of a, a, a transistor-based computer here. The problem became wiring the things together. They were so small and trying to actually hand wire each of those together, solder the wires together and, and create the circuitry, that became the problem. And I guess during the Cold War, we came to need 
uh, that computational capability of a computer on a space mission because of the space race that, that came after uh, the Cold, you know, during the Cold War, right at the beginning there when uh, President Kennedy launched this mission to send a man to the moon, there was a need for a computer to navigate during part of that uh, flight. And the transistor-based ones just weren't going to cut it because, for one, uh, they had they were wired together and they would probably shake apart, you know, during the liftoff, and they were just too big. And uh, so anyway, during this time, the innovation that came around was a, the concept of an integrated circuit. There's a primitive one over here on the right, but an integrated circuit, um, which is also abbreviated as as IC, is is basically. Uh, what you get here is you also get the wiring. Uh, I'll, I'll say plus wiring. <laughs> because what you get is the circuit, the components, uh, plus the wiring that goes with it. So you can actually print onto this the transistors plus other components like capacitors, but you can print the wires with it so it can be reproduced. And also it doesn't have to be hand done. Uh, that kind of opened up. Uh, in the future that this mass production of computers that we see <clears throat> because this way it, you didn't have to hand do it every time so integrated circuits were that next innovation and the only thing that's really happened since then is the idea that you could put all of the circuitry for a computer on a single chip so an integrated circuit is the components and the wiring but a microprocessor is the, the specific circuitry for a, a computer. Now we see one down here, uh, this Intel Core i7, or let's see, six core i7 Intel uh, CPU that has, if you read there, 1.17 billion transistors on that chip. And, and what we're actually talking about is on the, the size of a fingernail because you know the actual chip that's inside this packaging is that big you know uh, when they make these this person's holding a wafer of them here and um, there's just a small uh, and that's hundreds or maybe a thousand processors on that wafer each one is the size of a fingernail the packaging has to be bigger just so that it will connect into the you know the pins that you need to to, to pull the data off or, or send data through uh, so the packaging has to be a lot bigger, but the thing itself is, is that big, and that's how many you can fit in it. We started back here talking about uh, basically Charles Babbage and mechanical computers, and then about Conrad Zusa and relay-based computers, where one bit was you know the size of a relay that was mechanical and had a moving part to it, up to uh, the present day, which this is a pretty modern processor here with 1.17 billion transistors on the size of a fingernail. So that's kind of how hardware has progressed just in, what, 80 years, 70 years. Um, the next thing, and I guess I'm not really going to go into this in this podcast, is Moore's Law. And, and Moore's Law is, is kind of a, a predictive algorithm that tells uh, what you can expect computer hardware to be like uh, in a certain number of years because there's been kind of a, a predictable uh, increase in that every somewhere between 18 months and two years some people even say one year the number of transistors that can be fit into the same space doubles uh, that has great implications for the future um, at, at least as far as computer power goes some futurists like Ray Kurzweil have taken that and used that to predict that we may have unbelievably powerful computers in just a short period of time uh, and, he, and Moore's Law is, is really what he's basing a lot of his ideas on. We will talk some more about Ray Kurzweil in the class, and there's some more in the comic book here about Ray Kurzweil and, and some of his ideas. Some people think he's, he's crazy, but I think it's interesting to just think about the power uh, that computers have, especially um, located here in Knoxville. Uh, Oak Ridge National Lab is just over the hill there, and they are constantly, you know, one of the they have one of the fastest computers in the world usually I think right now their machine is either the second or third fastest the Jaguar uh, but they also have the Kraken which is still I think in the top 10 uh, fastest computers in the world so there is uh, you know this understanding that uh, computer speed we, we hear a lot about it here with their location with UT and, and ORNL but anyway, I hope you enjoyed this podcast, and the next one I'm going to do is to tell you a little bit about binary, 
and then show how information is stored, um, like a, a picture or a movie, how those are encoded in ones and zeros, and then stored on the switches that we, we just talked about. So uh, take care and I'll see you next time.